Shalom Aleichem. This is a, a beautiful event. It's such an honor for Yivo to be hosting it, and I welcome all of you very warmly here this afternoon. I'm Jonathan Brent, Executive Director of the Yivo Institute. Um, it is obvious to me, just looking out at this audience and seeing all of the faces here, uh, and, and seeing the, the uh, demographics here, so to speak. Uh, there are young people and old people and middle-aged people and uh, onlookers and members of the Bund. Uh, the Bund, the spirit of the Bund is uh, still quite vibrant. The spirit of the Bund is still something of great importance and it is a great privilege for the Evo Institute to be able to be a venue through which that importance and that vitality can get channeled through events like this. So thank you. Thank you to everybody. I want to thank all of the organizers for today's event. Uh, uh, my special thanks goes to Alex Weiser, who uh, has become uh, the uh, official YIVO representative to the Bund, <laughs> as far as I can tell, as a result of this uh, project. I want to thank Workman's Circle and Jewish Currents for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, I think that uh, Yankel Salant did an extraordinary job <laughs> with this. And uh, Irena Klepfish and Daniel Sawyer uh, who edited this deserve tremendous <laughs> gratitude from everyone. Um, I don't want to uh, take up too much time, but I do want to say a couple of words about where YIVO is going that might interest you. I think m many of you, if not all of you, have seen the recent article in the New York Times about the, the new discovery of, uh, of materials in Vilnius. 200,000, 170 to 200,000 pages of documents that have been in a, essentially, uh, in, a, in a secret place. We still don't have the whole story behind this. Uh, since, uh, since 1948 have been discovered. Uh, Rob, Roberta Newman, who was here somewhere, Robbie, where are you? Back there, Robbie Newman and Ludmila Sholachova and Sarah Panaktera is the Evo team that is working to digitize these materials, archive these materials, uh, and explore this extraordinary new find. Uh, these materials are of all sorts, literary, religious, political, um, theatrical, um, musical, and uh, as you will note from the article that came out, uh, we believe that it's going to keep scholars busy for at least another two generations. But in addition to this great project, the Edward Blank Vilna, uh, Ivo Vilna uh, Collections Project, uh, I want everybody in this room to know that the next project that we intend to undertake here is the digitization and the complete processing of the Bund archive. Uh, it, is a, it is a buried continent of historical treasures uh, that is sitting in our archive and our aim is to unbury this, to make it public, to make it public and, and accessible to the whole world, to the whole Jewish world. And when I say that, what I mean is that our world is dispersed from uh, Beijing and Tokyo down to uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, the Fiji Islands, Uganda, Uruguay, and the state of Idaho. And, uh, and the only way to reach all of these people is to digitize these materials, 
to digitize them, put them online, have scholars translate these materials, put them in galleries, create, uh, create narratives and context so that people can understand what this tremendous past was and why this past retains its vitality that is so evident today in, in this event. Um, so, without any further ado, I, if th any, any of you who is interest in, interested in learning more about this project or interested in learning more about the Edward Blank Yivo Vilna Collections project, please see me, please see Robbie, please see Alex, or just uh, call us up and we'll be happy to give you a tour. And so now it's my really, truly great pleasure and honor to welcome Irena Klepfish uh, up to the podium to uh, begin the event. Thank you. Welcome. I'm speaking on behalf of the ad hoc committee that organized today's event. Jonathan already has mentioned our co-sponsors, the Evo, Workman Circle, Jewish Currents. I'd like to also add a few thanks to uh, some of the members of our committees, very specifically people who worked and behind the scenes and whose work might not be immediately visible. Kara Beckenstein, Nellie Furman, Abe Goldwasser, Etty Goldwasser, Leo Grimbone, Fagala Jacobs, Jack Jacobs, Rita Mead, Zalman Lotek, Irene Pletka, Eddie Portnoy, Moish Rosenfeld, Yankel Salant, Danny Sawyer, and Alex Weiser. They're responsible for this event. <laughs> I also want to mention that we are very privileged and honored to have with us today three people who are intimately have been connected to the Bund of the past and of the more recent, uh, of the very long past and the more recent past. Haya Palewski, who joined the Bund during the war outside of the Vilna ghetto and was a partisan. Um, Nelly Bledunkel, who was who was uh, a child in Warsaw before the war, whose parents were very active in the Bund, and Michal Baron, who was the director of Camp Hemshech, the camp that was started by Bundists in 1959 in upstate New York. If they could possibly get stand, perhaps, and get acknowledged by this audience. <laughs> Let me say a few words about what we're honoring today, the Jewish Labor Bund. In the Yiddish song, Avremel der Mafwicher, Avremel the Pickpocket, by the poet Mordechai Gebirtik, Avremel initially boasts about his skills as a con man and a grifter. But Gebirtik, a member of the Krakow Bund, provides Avremel with a self awareness that leads him finally to lament his criminal life. He realizes that had he not been an orphan brought up in schmutz, in the dirt of the street, had he had caring parents, he might have become someone to be admired. Though Avremel, through Avremel, Gebirtik articulates the Bund's belief in people's inherent goodness, but a goodness that is only activated in a just and humane society. Like the fictive Avremel, Leibitschke Berman, a real apprentice carpenter, emerged in Dvinsk in the early 1900s out of abject poverty and painful family relationships. But unlike Avremel, Leibitschke became a respected organizer and accounted for his productive life in the dedication to his autobiography in Leif Funyolen, The Passage of Years. 
gewidmet mein geistigen Vater und Erzieher. Der, der allgemeine jüdischen Arbeiterbund in Lita, Polen und Russland. Dedicated to my spiritual father and nurturer, the General Jewish Workers' Bund in Lithuania, Poland, and Russia. Leibichka's dedication reflects the Bund's almost parental and all-encompassing influence. At a 20-year founding celebration, Vladimir Medem, the legendary Bundist leader, commented how the movement had already by 1917 become an integral part of Jewish life. Kein ein Gebiet von politischen, politischen und gesellschaftlichen Leben ist nicht geblieben äußer sein Haschbar. Politischer Kampf, professionelle Bewegung, Kulturarbeit, kooperative Tätigkeit, nationale Auflebung, Presse, Literatur, jüdische Sprache, Widerstand kennen Programme, als hat das der Bund hereingenommen. Not a single area of political and social life remained untouched by the Bund, Vladimir Medem said. Political struggle, the trade union movement, cultural work, cooperative activities, national revival, the press, literature, the Yiddish language, resistance to pogroms, all this the Bund encompassed. The Bund's aim to transform the Jewish environment naturally related to create for poor Jewish children programs and organizations which promoted socialist ideals and helped them to develop their leadership skills and secular cultural sensibilities. In her moving essay about the Medem Sanatorium, the institution world famous for, for its progressive pedagogy, Shoshka Ehrlich recounts how some worried that the children would be spoiled by the sanatorium and unhappy when they returned home. But Shloyma Gilinski, the sanatorium's Bundes director, countered emphatically. Die Eltern verschicken zu unsere Kinder, haben zu uns zu treu, und sei es lieb, was die Kinder bringen von der Madame Sanatorium heim. Die Kinder sind in die erste Schwalben, was sagen an dem Frühling. The parents who send us their children have confidence in us, and they like what their children bring home from the Madam Sanatorium. The children are but the first swallows who announce the spring. The intensity and certainty of the Bund's ideals in the lives of the first and second generation Bundists, those who experienced the movement from its earliest days to its most successful period in interwar Europe, cannot be overstated and, and ironically became most visible during the worst circumstances of the Second World War. Patty Kremer, a first generation Bundes leader in Vilna, was already in her 70s when confined to the Vilna ghetto and became known as its neshama, its soul. On September 23rd, 1944, when the ghetto was being liquidated, and, the remain, and she and the remaining Jews were being transported to Panar for extermination. Patty Kremer was reported to have said, We will all embrace and sing the Bund's anthem, and death will not be so terrible. Our committee, which 10 months ago decided to organize today's celebration, is made up in part by the children and grandchildren of those extraordinary first and second generation Bundists. These committee members listened to and were shaped by the stories of Volksschulers, secular Yiddish schools, the Medem Sanatorium, Skiff, Sozialistischer Kinderverband, Zukunft, Jugendbund, Morgenstern, and resistance groups during the war. There, some experienced the Bund firsthand through summer camps and local groups that were organized after 1945. And some continued speaking and promoting Yiddish. Some did scholarly work on the Bund, 
Many intended and created cultural events and sang di shvu at celebrations and at ghetto academias, ghetto memorials. And some had no personal contact with the Bund, but discovered it through books and history and found themselves moved by its ideology and vision. But no matter the background, we all agreed that the Bund's remarkable legacy needed to be honored and made better known. We agreed that today's celebration is not to be a two-hour nostalgic escape from our disturbing present. Instead, we wanted to jog our memories, to fill gaps in our knowledge, and to guide us in our thinking about how to approach the political, social, and cultural issues facing us today. Our hope is that our program will inspire you, that you will feel motivated and energized, and that after it is over, all of us together will continue to discuss the Bund and its relevance to our lives, to our art, and to our activism. We will begin with the historical panel, which will be chaired and introduced by Daniel Sawyer. Danny teaches American and Jewish history at Fordham University. He's the author of, with Annie Poland, of the emerging metropolis, New York Jews in the Age of Immigration, 1840 to 1920, which won the National Jewish Book Award in 2012. In, 18, um, in 1880, through, I'm sorry, in 1980, he's not that old. In 1980 and 1982, he was secretary of the Jewish Socialist Youth Bund, Madame Jewish Socialist Group in New York City. He's also the co-editor of the handsome commemorative book that you all received with your ticket. Please welcome Daniel Sawyer and the panel. Thank you, Irina, um, the co-editor of the handsome booklet that you just got. So our charge, this panel's charge is primarily a historical and academic one to explain the history and the ideology of the Bund. Uh, but as uh, Irina said, um, our goal is also to talk a little bit about the contemporary relevance of the Bund and Bundism. Since we're meeting in New York, it makes sense to mention uh, the importance of the Bund to uh, local history. Uh, some of you may remember last, if you can remember last year, 2016, um, early in 2016, there was a right-wing candidate in the Republican primaries, and he attacked another right-wing candidate in the Republican primaries for having what he called New York values. I think what he meant, I think what he meant was a, some kind of Greustadtische libertinism. But he could have been talking about uh, egotistical acquisitiveness and predatory capitalism, which after all are New York values and have been for hundreds of years. But there's another set of New York values as well, an oppositional set of New York values that we also saw uh, in evidence uh, in 2016. And these are the values of social justice, of uh, social solidarity, of social security, uh, indeed of social democracy, uh, what historians have called social democracy, a kind of American social democracy in one city, exemplified by extensive, uh, just for a few examples, by extensive public and cooperative housing, uh, free public education, from kindergarten through university, uh, by easily accessible health care, uh, widespread public transportation, uh, strong trade unions, and so on. And the Bund had a hand in this. Leaders like David Dubinsky and Sidney Hillman of the garment unions were Bundists in their youth, and Dubinsky at least had uh, retained ties uh, to the Bund for a long time. 
But others in the Socialist Party, in the American Labor and Liberal Parties, even in the Democratic Party, uh, the Workmen's Circle, the Jewish Daily Forward, the Jewish Labor Committee, Bundists contributed mightily to the building of, this New York's, of these New York social democratic values that unfortunately have been obscured in recent decades, not just nationally, but locally as well. And they're worth recovering. On the other hand, uh, the world is different. The Jewish world is very different from what, what it was in the Bundist heyday. Uh, about 40% of the Jewish people in the world live in the United States. Another 40% live in Israel. Uh, Jews in the United States are mostly linguistically assimilated. Uh, here we are speaking English at a Bundist event. Uh, Israel is, in fact, the only place where uh, Jews uh, produce uh, secular Jewish culture in a Jewish language in high proportions. Uh, in both places, the Orthodox sectors are sector is growing, and even liberal Jews often seek spiritual uh, paths. Uh, many Jews around the world uh, now see the left as antithetical not only to their own personal, uh, their own personal class interests, but Jewish interests as well. So I've also asked the panelists here uh, to address these questions. What, what, um, what does the history of the Bund have to say uh, to these issues in this situation? What is still relevant of the history and the ideas that we are gonna be talking about today? So I'm gonna introduce the first speaker. Um, uh, he's gonna speak and then I'll introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, David Slutsky is assistant professor in the Yashchik Arnold Jewish Studies program at the College of Charleston. Uh, previously, I, I was looking at the banners outside. I didn't see the Bundist banner from Charleston, you know, but maybe I missed it. I saw Philadelphia, I saw New York. Uh, previously, he was an early career development fellow in 2011, 2013 at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia where he received his PhD in 2010. His book, The International Jewish Labor Bund After 1945, Toward a Global History, was published by Rutgers University Press in 2012. And it looks at the attempts of Bundists to adapt their shattered movement in the wake of the Holocaust. His current research focuses on Holocaust survivors in the post-war United States, on humor and Holocaust uh, representation, and on genera generational memories of the Holocaust. And he is also a fourth generation Bundist. So David will speak today on the Bund, history of a movement. Thanks for the generous introduction, Danny, and uh, thanks also to Moish, uh, Irke, uh, for the invitation, thanks to Alex for uh, making this happen, and to all the YIVO staff and everyone on the committee. I'm extremely honoured to be here 45 years ago in 1972 at the Fifth World Conference of the Bund. My father, Charles Slukey, or some of you knew him as Sluggo, spoke uh, on behalf of the Melbourne Bund. So it's an enormous honour for me to get to... Um, sort of come that full circle. Um, and as many of you know, uh, Sluggo passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, so it means a lot. I was raised in a Bundist family, in a Bundist community. And so to be here to celebrate uh, the past of the Bund and pay tribute to the major contribution that it made uh, is, uh, again, a massive honor. So I'm here to offer some reflections on the history of the Bund, uh, a movement that uh, really helped to bring East European Jewish civilization into the modern world that helped to shape the Jewish 20th century, not only in Europe, but uh, as Danny pointed out, in the United States, uh, in Australia and beyond. Uh, and I want to start, uh, at least I want to intersperse the story with the story of uh, one particular family of Bundists, an ordinary 
rank-and-file family. I could talk about many of the great leaders and intellectuals, but instead I want to tell this story through one family whose connection to the Bund goes back almost to its founding, and that family is mine. Uh, over four generations, my family has been intimately tied to the Bund and its principles and ideology. In Warsaw, Wroclawek, Siberia, Wroclaw, Paris, and Melbourne on my father's side, in Warsaw, Shanghai, Mexico City, and Melbourne on my mother's side, my family has never wavered in its commitment to the Bund's mission. And it was really through their connection to the movement that my great-grandfather and my grandfather were able to find refuge and family wherever they found themselves in the world. And this is one of the great contributions of the Bund, is creating this global mishpocha. It's one of the things I've argued in my work in the past. And it's one of the reasons I think the Bund endured as long as it did. It was much more than a political movement. For those raised in its orbit, the Bund was a mishpocha, a family. Dysfunctional at times, uh, as families go, but warm and loving and protective. Being part of the Bund was to be part of something much bigger. It was identity as much as ideology that kept people attached to the Bund throughout the great conflagrations of the 20th century. So the Bund's establishment in Vilna in October 1897, 120 years ago, was the culmination of more than a decade of agitation by Russian Jewish intellectuals throughout the Russian Pale of Settlement, the area in Western Russia in which Jews had been confined since early in the 19th century. That was a world in which Jews lived in desperate poverty, an emerging industrial working class, very urbanized but not very modernized. A traditional world where religion ruled the Jewish street and where Jews suffered many, many layers of discrimination. Throughout the 1880s and 1890s, these intellectuals agitated among Jewish workers, organizing clandestine reading circles and educational circles that helped bring these modern ideas and modern science to a traditional society. They organized a strike movement and radicalized Jewish workers uh, and paved the way for the founding of a much bigger movement. The Bund was uh, a truly revolutionary force on the Jewish street. Not only did they seek to join the broader Russian revolutionary forces and overthrow uh, the Tsarist government, but they helped to transform Jewish life in Eastern Europe in a very meaningful and deliberate way. The Bund was a secular Marxist party committed to fostering Yiddish culture and committed to replacing capitalism with a fairer uh, social democratic society. And I'll leave my colleagues to talk more about those things as, as we go. Its leaders asserted that Jews weren't only a religious group, but a nation, one bound by history, culture, language. Ideas which were relatively new in Jewish life, built over the course of the 19th century, but which didn't find their full expression until the first decades, really, of the 20th century. The Bund led the way. Its education and reading circles fostered literacy and numeracy among ordinary workers, tailors, blacksmiths, artisans, merchants, who typically had no more than a rudimentary education in Jewish religious texts. Not only did they seek to empower Jewish workers through education, but the Bund, more than any other Jewish political movement, opened pathways for people who hadn't had the opportunity to participate in Jewish political society before, particularly women. In the Bundist movement, not only were women welcomed as members, uh, but they rose to positions of influence and authority. In other words, the Bund democratized Jewish life. Jewish workers in Tsarist Russia suffered under the yoke of anti-Semitism, which made it almost impossible for Jews to advance outside their state of desperate poverty, discriminated against legally and in the economic sphere, target of pogroms, it's no wonder that, that Jews flock to the Bund and other political movements seeking a solution to these problems. I hope this works. No. Nope. We'll get there. Ah, glorious, okay. So that secret meeting of Jewish socialist leaders from around Russia in October 1897 
in, an, in a small attic in Vilna, in the, on the outskirts of Vilna, was dangerous and momentous. There they brought together groups from around the Pale of Settlement to form the General Jewish Labor Bund of Russia and Poland, and later Lithuania was added to the name. Very quickly, this new party became an important factor among Jewish communities, playing a crucial role also in the growth of the Russian socialist movement. By 1905, when the Bund inspired thousands of Russian Jews to take to the streets to participate in the 1905 revolution, the Bund had grown to a movement of tens of thousands, one of the biggest players on the Jewish street. It published clandestine journals, organized self-defense groups, and helped organize Jewish workers within the broader context of the Russian labor movement. Okay, my clicker's not working, so I'll just gesture when I need to change. Bundes stayed with the movement through the difficult years of the repression after the 1905 revolution and were later re-energised uh, by the Russian Revolution in 1917. It was around that time that Maizeda, still a teenager, uh, and I think, still a teenager, joined the party in Warsaw, probably, and we don't know exactly the story, following in the footsteps of his older sister, Chava later Chavis Lutzke Kestin, the, right, the Israeli Yiddish writer. He broke away from his traditional upbringing like so many Jews of his generation. In a time when millions of Jews in Eastern Europe were beginning to embrace modernity in politics, literature, culture, many left that old world of religious observance and superstition behind them. In their droves, these Jews joined movements like the Bund and Zionism, they learned the language of their surrounds, Russian and Polish. Uh, they read the burgeoning body of secular Yiddish and Hebrew literature. They studied natural science, math, Marx, Greats, Herzl, Dubnov, Otto Bauer, Mitzkevich, Tolstoy, Roman Rolon, my Buber's favorite writer. They escaped what they saw as the restrictive clutches of Judaism and joined the revolution in the Jewish world in which they imagine themselves as a modern nation, standing alongside other modern nations. They saw themselves as equal to those around them, deserving of equal rights, opportunity, and security. And the Russian Bund was foremost among the movements, offering this sense of dignity and empowerment to ordinary Jewish workers. Uh, oh, thank you. Not long after the Bolsheviks took power in Russia, the original party was swallowed up by the Communist Party and ultimately liquidated in 1924. The Bund Center shifted to newly reconstituted Poland, where operating legally for the very first time, it reached its zenith. There, its expansive counterculture filtered into the homes of tens of thousands of Polish Jews. In that heady period, that short 20-year cessation of open war between the major European powers, the Bund positioned itself as the farthest reaching Jewish political movement in one of the most important Jewish civilizations in history. Its leaders fashioned a network of institutions that catered to so many needs of the Jewish working poor. Uh, great. There they founded a children's movement, SCIF, a youth movement, Zukunft, a women's auxiliary, Yaf, a sports organization, Morgenstern. Along with Alinka Poiletzion, the Bund oversaw a vast network of Yiddish secular schools. The Bund organized Jewish trade unions, provided welfare to Jews in need, and supported an array of cultural outpourings, publishing newspapers, journals, and socialist books and pamphlets. One could be born into a Bundist family and live a thickly Bundist life almost from birth. By the mid to late 1930s, the Bund had positioned itself as the most popular Jewish political movement uh, in Poland's largest Jewish centers. With its multi, and there's uh, Henrik Ehrlich and Viktor Alter, the two most beloved leaders of the Polish Bund leading a May Day march. In the, the caption on the Yiva website said the late 1920s, but they look a bit older actually. Um, I suspect it's the late 1930s. Uh, with its multi-tiered organization, its role leading the struggle against Polish anti-Semitism, from 1936 to 39, the Bund scored comprehensive victories in the major 
uh, city council and Kihila elections throughout Poland. It was in this period that Mizeda consolidated his relationship to the movement, and that's him top centre of that picture on the Wroclawek um, Bund Committee. Newly resettled in the central Polish city of Wroclawek, he joined the committee, married a local Bundist, Gitl Wisniewska, who was the founder of the local Tsukumf chapter. Uh, together, they had two sons, Shmulek and Chaim, both Skifistan by the eve of the war. So they were thoroughly committed to their movement, like so many families who found their way into the Bund at the time. It was in that local movement in Wroclawek that he forged lifelong connections that would help him survive World War II and help him to find somewhere to resettle in the war's aftermath. It was there he found his mission, his calling in life, that would guide him until his death in 1978. When the Nazis invaded Poland in September 1939, Bundes throughout Poland maintained that connection. In dozens of cities and towns, they participated in the party's underground activities, running a rich array of educational, cultural, and political activities, despite the terrible conditions and despite the danger in doing so. They organized schools, soup kitchens, political discussions and speeches, they published illegal newspapers and took enormous risks in order to establish networks between ghettos. The movement's activities depended, depending on the situation. In some ghettos, Bundes participated in the Jewish councils, the Judenrat. In others, they refused. In many instances, Bundes were at the forefront of resistance activities, most famously in the Warsaw Ghetto, where in April and May 1943, Young Bundisten, Zukunftisten, Skifisten, bravely fought alongside Jews across the political spectrum. Bundists, young and old, worked as smugglers, couriers, working alongside the Polish underground and make, trying to make sure that the Nazis' genocide couldn't be kept secret. It was the Bundist courier, Zalman Friedrich, having followed the train from Warsaw to Treblinka in the summer of 1942, who first brought news of the killing operations at Treblinka, by then perhaps the most deadly killing factory in Europe. Outside Poland, the party's leaders worked ardently to bring news of the Jews' suffering to the governments of the world. In London and New York, they sought to publicize the Nazis' crimes to bring pressure on the world to intervene. Uh, in May 1943, Schmuel Artur Ziegelboim in protest to the world's indifference, took his own life, despairing at his inability to, conf to convey the urgency of the Jews' situation, his wife having died in the Warsaw Ghetto. The war years were catastrophic for the Bund. During those six years, most of its members, its rank and file, were murdered. Mizeda's wife, and sons and his sister, active in the Bund's underground in the Wroclawek ghetto, were among the tens of thousands of Bundists and Bund supporters who fell victim to the Nazis. On the 27th of April, 1942, they were deported to Chelmno and killed in mobile gas vans, their ashes scattered in the forest at Chelmno or maybe dumped into the Nair River. Such was the fate of the vast majority of Bundists alongside the rest of Polish Jewry. Although many of its leaders managed to escape at the outset of the war, the Bund's most beloved figureheads, Henrik Ehrlich and Victor Alter, were murdered in 1941 as prisoners of the Soviet Union. The Bund's membership was decimated, its institutional structure was torn apart, and it would take some deep soul-searching in the years after the war's conclusion before the party could re-establish itself under new circumstances. Still, Bundes maintained their connection through the terrible war years in the attempts to rebuild Jewish Poland after the war and later on the soil of many different countries globally. Their adherence was based on ideology but went so far beyond that. When they might have easily despaired, turned away from the party and its values, many surviving Bundes chose to continue the work that they had put on hold in 1939. In Poland, they tried to rebuild their shattered mo movement. 
They established Bund groups in the DP camps of Germany, Austria, Italy, working with the Jewish Labour Committee to try and bring a shtickle, Bundes life, to the few surviving members in a world where Zionism was becoming more and more dominant. And this is the Wrocław uh, Bund Committee. Wrocław became one of the major centres of the post-war Bund in Poland. In 1946, returning from his exile in Siberia, Maizeda settled with his new wife, Maibuba, in Wrocław, newly incorporated into Poland. He joined the growing Bund movement of Lower Silesia, participating in the ambitious project to rebuild Jewish life on the ashes of three million Polish Jews. With the mass exodus of the remaining Jews of Poland in the last years of the 1940s, though, and the continuing spectre of anti-Semitism and pogroms, there was little future for the Bund in Central and Eastern Europe. And Zayda left, like so many Polish Jews, with his pregnant wife for Paris. In 1949, the Bund in Poland was liquidated by the communist government after half a century, offering, offering Polish Jews a vision of Poland where Jews were equal citizens, equally part of the project of building a socialist Poland. The movement took its final breath. It was at that time, though, that the, that the Bund truly became a global movement, as those remaining Bundists found their homes all around the world. By the mid-1950s, the Bund had already reconstituted itself as the International Jewish Labour Bund, with a central committee based in New York and constituent groups in 31 cities in 13 different countries. These local chapters tried to create some of that tarn, that flavour of the Bundes life they'd left behind. In cities like Melbourne, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, Stockholm, Montevideo, Los Angeles, Paris, Johannesburg, Tel Aviv, among many others, these organizations participated in local Jewish life and in the local Jewish, in the local socialist and labor movements. Even though the Bund was by then a minor factor in global Jewish debates, on a local level, the Bund managed to have a meaningful impact on the lives of their members and other Jews. My father, Sluggo, was raised in the nascent skiff movement in Melbourne and grew up in a thickly Bundist environment. Their small cottage in the immigrant neighborhood of inner Melbourne was an informal center of Bundist life. After graduating as a helper at Skiff, Sluggo traveled to New York in 1972, where he worked at Camp Hemshach and worked for the Bund uh, throughout the year. Through the Bund, he became involved in the Australian Labor Party, the new left movement on campus, the Yiddish community in Melbourne, the Bund offered a pathway into this bigger world for him. Melbourne was one of the more robust Bund movements after the war, but this story was replicated in communities around the world where a uh, local Bundes group forged their own path inspired by the Bund. In December 2015, uh, Sluggo and I attended the Adrian Cooper Memorial Concert, uh, which was dedicated to uh, Songs of the Bund. And together we sang the Shvua. And Sluggo said to me, like he had actually said to me lots of times in my life, make sure you sing this at my funeral. And three days later he died, unexpectedly. And a week later we were singing it at his funeral. And partly why I think the Bund is so important is that sense of connection that it fostered among its members, that sense of belonging it forged, that even in 2015, we were singing the Shvua at the funeral of a Bundist. The Melbourne Bund is really the only one left. Mostly, Bund organisations went the way of most other secular Yiddish institutions with declining con constituencies, a lack of funding, and a lack of people to produce uh, materials. So to Danny's question, is the Bund still relevant today? Is there a place for doikate, Yiddish, Yiddishkeit, socialism? And the short answer is, of course, it's relevant. In a world where injustice still prevails, 
where the threat of racism, anti-Semitism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, genocide are ever present, where inequality continues to keep millions in desperate poverty and despair, the Bund can serve as inspiration in the ongoing fight for justice and for fairness. In a time when Jews continue to be dispersed across the globe, where young Jews are searching for a meaningful attachment to their Jewishness and to a Jewish past, the Bund's early vision of a kind of multicultural society rooted in democratic socialism can serve as inspiration for a world to, as we strive for a world of Yoishe, Gerechtigkeit, Chaveshaft. Thank you. Thank you, David. So as David mentioned, um, he, he mentioned towards the beginning of his talk the principles on which the Bund was founded. I don't think the Bund elaborated the kind of ideology maybe that the Zionists did. You know, you can have volumes and volumes of uh, works of Zionist philosophy. But the Bund did have certain um, uh, Grundprinzipen, some basic uh, principles and values and an ideology. And in organizing the panel and the event, uh, we settled on these, that they are socialism, Dorkeit, and Weltliche Yiddishkeit, secular Jewish culture. And so the, our next speakers will uh, discuss um, those aspects of the, Bund, of the Bund's thinking. And I'll introduce them all at once, and then you'll come up in the order I've introduced you. So Marvin Zuckerman uh, served as chair of the English department for 15 years at Los Angeles Valley College and as dean as instruction for six years before retiring in 2002. In addition to publishing uh, college English textbooks, he has edited several volumes of Yiddish literature and translation, uh, written on Yehoi, the poet Yehoyish for the Dictionary of Literary Biography, Writers in Yiddish, and published articles in various periodicals, uh, some in Yiddish, in, in publications like Affen Schwell and Unser Zeit, and some in English in Jewish Currents and New Politics. In 2016, Purdue University Press published his translation of Bernard Goldstein's 20 Jahre in Warschauer Bund, uh, translated as 20 Years in the Jewish Labor Bund, a memoir of interwar Poland, which I see you have a copy of, and everyone, uh, everyone should go out and buy a copy of this book immediately uh, because it's it's amazing, and it really talks about, like, like David was talking about, the life on the streets, you know, and in the homes of, of Bundes and the Bund. And Marvin will speak on the socialism of the Bund. Uh, Jack Jacobs is a professor of political science at John Jay College and the Graduate Center City University of New York. He's the author of On Socialists and the Jewish Question After Marx in 1992, uh, Bundist Counterculture in Interwar Poland, 2009, and the Frankfurt School Jewish Lives and Antisemitism, 2015, and is the editor of Jewish Politics in Eastern Europe, The Bund at 100, 2001, and of Jews and Leftist Politics, 2017. He was the, uh, oh, I forgot to uh, mention about Marvin that he's also the son of Yiddish speaking Bundists from Warsaw, Warsaw Poland who were active in the Jewish labor movement, and about Jack, uh, that he was the porter uh, at the Bundesrun summer camp Hemshech in the early 1970s, <laughs> and, was active, and was active in the Jewish Socialist Bund later that decade, Jewish Socialist Youth Bund later that decade. And Jack will speak on Dorkeit, or hearness, Zionism and is Dorkeit, or hearness, Zionism in Israel, the Bund's perspective. Hinde Enna Burstein is a third generation Bundist whose father, I'm the only one who's not a third generation Bundist. I, my great grandfather was a religious Zionist. My grandfather was a communist. <laughs> and what can I say, you know? It's like, 
as uh, Sholem Hertz, Sholem, Sholem Hertz once uh, looked at me and said, ah, the ain the close gewogen prost, he said. This is what happened. So Hinde Emma Burstin is a third generation Bundist whose father, Simcha Burstin, was the first Helfer or leader of Skiff in, in Melbourne, Australia. She is a Yiddish teacher, bilingual writer, researcher, and poetry translator. She coordinates and lectures in the Jacob Cronhill program in Yiddish language and culture at Monash University. And her PhD research on gender, sex, and violence in 1920s Yiddish women's poetry examines the secularization of Yiddish life and literature. A lifelong social justice activist, she is a founding member of the Jewish lesbian group in, of Victoria. She is a proud Yiddish, Yiddish mame to two Yiddish-speaking skifisten living in a Weltlchel, a uh, secular Yiddish lifestyle in Eckfeld, which I believe is a neighborhood of Melbourne. Right? That's, right. <laughs> That's what it says here. And Hinda will talk about the Bund and Weltliche Yiddishkeit, secular Yiddish culture. So Marvin, why don't you start? Yeah, so they told me I had to speak about socialism. Actually, they wanted Bernie Sanders to do it, but <laughs> they had to settle with me. He couldn't make it. <laughs> uh, and they uh, restricted me to 12 minutes. Other, I think there's a hook somewhere in case I go over that. Anyway, so um, I will, uh, you'll forgive me if I read it, but I'm trying to do it in a lively way, I hope. The Bund from its beginning described itself as a Marxist revolutionary party wanting thus to place itself in the camp of those opposed to the reformist tendencies in the world socialist movement. The Bund believed the overthrow of the czarist autocracy and the establishment of a socialist order could not be achieved by the gradual reform of the existing capitalist system and would require a revolution. In practice, however, the Bund strove unremittingly to make the lives and working conditions of the Jewish workers better. The Bund did not believe in Lenin's dictum, the worse, the better. The Bund organized to make things better before that revolutionary movement, moment came. In the years leading up to the founding of the Bund in 1897 and in the years following the conditions of the working class in the Russian Empire and later in independent Poland, conditions were harsh. The working day was 12 to 14 to even 18 hours a day. The workplaces were squalid, unsanitary, unhealthful. Child labor was prevalent. Abuse and degradation of women, children, and laborers in general was widespread. The Bund believed that capitalism, as Marx taught, contained within itself the seeds of its own destruction, that socialism was the inevitable next stage in the development of society, a society of the democratic rule by the working class. Socialism would be a system without exploitation, a system of production for social need and not for profit. Imperialism would come to an end as would strife between nations, peoples, classes. It was a beautiful dream, an ideal the Bund found worth fighting for. But in the meantime, until that moment, the Bund organized tens of thousands of Jewish workers into trade unions, fighting to make their lives better, filling them with hope and pride, leading successful strikes throughout the pale, strikes among the weavers of Lodge, the brushmakers of Warsaw, the leather workers of Lublin, slaughterers, coachmen, porters, garment workers all over the pale. Forging a mass movement, the Bund struggled against the Leninist Bolshevik line on the one hand and against what it conceived as a narrow, chauvinistic, unrealistic nationalist dream on the other. In 1898, it was the Bund that organized the first Russian Social Democratic Federation meeting from which Dan, Martov, Lenin, Plekhanov, 
and all the other founders and shapers of the coming Russian revolution emerged. Plekhanov, founder of the Russian Social Democratic Movement said, from a certain point of view, the Jewish workers may be considered the vanguard of the labor army in Russia. Bertram Wolf says the Bund at that time was the largest and best organized body of working men inside the Russian Empire. The Bund joined the Second International in 1900, three years after its founding. It participated in the Zimmerwald Conference in 1915-1916, seeking to end the war. After the war, the Bund did not affiliate with any international until 1930. In that year, joining the Labor and Socialist International, thus once again becoming an active partner in the non-communist, worldwide socialist movement. Fellow socialists from the so Polish Socialist Party often came to the aid of the Bund to fight off communist thugs and Polish fascist anti-Semitic pogromists. As social democrats, the Bund, except for a brief illusory moment in 1920-1921, remained in opposition to the anti-democratic dictatorial rule of Lenin and his followers. Here are the words of a prominent leader of the Bund, Henrik Erlach, who perished in Soviet imprisonment in 1942, speaking on that subject in 1918. Is the Soviet government a workers' government? No. It has no right to call itself a workers' government. It has no right to speak in the name of the Russian working class. Another revered Bundist leader, Vladimir Medin, put it this way. Socialism is the rule, the true rule, not the fictional rule of the majority, which must in the end take its fate into its own hands. A socialism based on the rule of the minority, however, is absurd. The Bolsheviks stay in power only because their terror has destroyed and made powerless all their opponents. And the 1924 Convention of the Bund put it still another way. The difference between us and the communists lies in the fact that they believe in the rule by the party. And we believe in the rule by the whole working class. We say the working class government must be answerable to the whole class. The communists, on the other hand, say that if the working class doesn't like the communist party government, the working class must still accept the will of the government and not the reverse. The chief error of the communist party lies in its effort to turn the might of the working class into a dictatorship of the central committee of the party over the proletariat. The Bund, on the other hand, was a thoroughly democratic organization. Unlike the communist Leninists, it believed in rule from the bottom up, not from the top down. It believed in this democratic vision, not only for the inevitable socialist society to come, but for the governance of its own party. Vladimir Medem, Henrik Ehrlich, Viktor Alter, Neuer Portnoy, and the other Bundes leaders could not and did not dictate to the Bund membership. They theorized, propounded, wrote, persuaded, but they could not and did not dictate. In 1920, Medem, their adored, iconic party leader, failed to persuade a majority at a party convention not to apply to join Lenin's common turn. Having failed in this, he left for America, still dedicated to the Bund, but unable to remain in a leadership position until such time, as he put it, that the Bund majority came to its senses and rejected the Leninist dictatorship, remaining true to democratic socialism. A year later, in 1921, it did just that, remaining so from that time on. While wrangling over these large political issues, the Bund continued its democratic brand of socialism in its day-to-day -day struggles to defend and improve the lives of, the, of its members by organizing, striking, and demonstrating for a shorter work week, higher pay, and ultimately for the dignity of the laboring Jewish masses. Warsaw Bund activist Bernard Goldstein's memoir, which I translated, 
uh, is full of examples of this day-to-day -day practical socialism of the Bund. There is no better source, I believe, for getting to know what the Bund was doing day-to-day to elevate, defend, and help in a practical way the poor working class Jews of Poland than to follow the exploits of Bund activist Bernhard Goldstein as he led the Bund actions on the street level. In his memoir, 20 years, uh, 20 Jahre in Warsaw Bund, 1919 to 1939, translated with the title 20 Years Jewish Labor Bund, Memoir of Interwar Poland, one can witness in his memoir, how the Bund militia fought off anti-Semitic hooligans, nationalist Polish party thugs, and semi-fascist government police, how it fought off communist attacks on the Bund's secular schools, on its union meetings, its cultural events, and on the Bund's medem sanitarium. And one can become witness to how the Bund prevented its poor working class members from being evicted from their dark, dank, slum dwellings and more much, much more. Throughout its struggles, the Bund behaved ethically. It did not subscribe to the communist doctrine that the ends justify the means, any means, no. The Bund believed the means corrupt, that evil means corrupt ends, that means must reflect the highest ideals of its vision of democratic socialism, that unethical, immoral means lead to unethical, immoral ends. Its leadership and the Bund itself was thus incorruptible, never stooping to unethical or immoral acts. This ethos was an integral part of the Bund's socialism. This was the socialism of the social democratic Bund. Opposed to dictatorial Leninism, Stalinism, the Bund had a democratic vision for a better world and carried on a courageous fight for the dignity and well-being of the Jewish working people. As they sang, Wäre schreckt sich und hat Meure, soll mit uns in Schlacht nicht gehen. Wir haben gesagt, Schlaf geboren und so bleiben in der Heim. Which means, who is afraid and is fearful should not go into battle with us. Let him stay at home. He was born a slave. And as the Bund's Schwur says, Wir schweren zu kämpfen auf Freiheit und Recht. Zerbrechen, zerbrechen die finstere Macht oder mit Heldensmut zu fallen in Schlacht. Or, as they translate, it's <laughs> to, we swear to fight for freedom and right, to break the black uh, might, or to fall hero uh, as heroes. Socialist, democratic, decent, and unafraid, that is the heritage of the Bund, the Lebender Bund. Thank you. The Bund, throughout its history, was committed to the idea of Dolkeit, the notion that Jewish socialists should focus on vastly improving economic and political conditions and on obtaining or ensuring equal rights in the countries in which Jews lived. In the first half of the 20th century, in lands such as Russia and Poland, Bundists opposed the anti-Semitic notion that Jews born and raised in those countries were foreigners and ultimately argued that the idea that the best way to combat anti-Semitism was by encouraging the creation of a Jewish homeland played into the hands of anti-Semitic movements. In 1901, the Bund formally resolved that Zionism was what it described as a bourgeois reaction to anti-Semitism. Insofar as Zionism pretended that it would be able to concentrate all of the Jewish population on the territory it sought, this resolution continued, Zionism was utopian and hindered the development of class consciousness. The Bund, committed to Marxism, contended throughout the remaining years of the Tsarist Empire that Zionism was a nationalistic ideology that obfuscated the interests of Jewish workers 
and that diverted attention from the pressing need to help organize a revolutionary movement which would overthrow the Tsarist regime. Dalton Lumeleben, the Bund proclaimed, Dalt is unser Land. Over time, in the period between the two world wars, Bundists began to differentiate between Zionism on the one hand and the rights of the Jewish community which lived in Palestine on the other. Prominent Bundists, including Viktor Alter, one of the foremost leaders of the Polish Bund, visited Palestine and reported on their impressions in the Bundist press. Alter, for one, devoted notable attention to the Arab population he encountered during his visit. By the late 1930s, the Polish Bund, having obtained a plurality in elections in major Jewish communities like those of Warsha and Wurz and Vilna, believed that it had won its long-term debate with its Zionist opponents. The psychological sense of being a victor may help to explain why, immediately before the beginning of World War II, the Bund published an explicit defense of the legitimate rights of the Jewish population of Palestine. In one of the last pre-war pieces on Palestine to appear in the Bundist press, uh, Maruzzi Ozech, a leading Bundist, analyzed the white paper, which had been issued by the British government in May of 39. Ozech predicted in his article that British interests would ultimately leave Britain to the proclamation of an independent Palestinian state in which Arabs would dominate. But Ozech also stressed in his article that the Jewish community of Palestine, by then numbering about half a million, had had very broad rights promised to it by England, and he proclaimed that it was the task of the Jewish population in Palestine to engage in a policy which would consolidate and even broaden its minority rights. Azhar concludes, and I'm quoting him here, the destruction of Zionism and the rights of the Jewish population of Palestine are two separate concepts. For perfectly understandable reasons, the Bund devoted the bulk of its energies during the course of the Second World War, primarily to saving the lives of those who could be saved and to opposing Nazis and Nazism. Bundists ultimately agreed to cooperate with Zionists in specific contexts in Nazi-occupied Poland, i.e. in the Warsaw Ghetto, in order to resist the ongoing extermination of the Jewish population. The Bund did not alter its ideological opposition to Zionism during this period. It simply, and altogether correctly, directed its very limited resources primarily against far more deadly opponents. But once the war had been won, and precisely as Zionist efforts to create a Jewish state gained intensity and support, the Bund resumed its active opposition to Zionism. The first post-war conference of the Bund held in 47 underscored that stance. In a resolution on Jewish issues adopted at the conference, the Bund proclaimed that, quote, Zionism cannot solve the problems of the great majority of the Jewish people who will continue to live outside the boundaries of Palestine. The Zionist requests for Jewish statehood in Palestine, the resolution continued, exposes the Jews there to dangers and difficulties threatening the very existence of the Jewish settlement in that country. In view of the foregoing, the 47 conference of the Bund concluded, the struggle against the theory and practices of Zionism must not be diminished. The second post-war conference of the Bund took place in 48, several months after the proclamation of the State of Israel. In the run-up to this conference, there were individual Bundists who called for an alteration in Bundist attitudes towards the notion of a Jewish state, but the Bund's most influential post-war leaders were not among them. The conference held in 48 took a strong stance, not only on Zionism, but also on Israel per se. 
after, it should be noted, sustained debate and significant opposition to that perspective by certain delegates. The heart of the resolution passed by the majority at the 48th conference reads in part, the Jewish people is and will remain a people of the world. Nine-tenths of its members dwelling outside Palestine. The state of Israel being the result of an artificial partition of Palestine and being established by a bloody struggle between Jew and Arab is not only far from solving the Jewish problem, but also jeopardizes the great and important accomplishments of the Jewish community in Palestine, even its very physical existence. Jewish socialists and Democrats should work for peace with the surrounding Arab states and for cooperation with the Palestinian Arab population through the establishment of a common Jewish Arab state based on the principles of democratic federalism. The position of the Bund, first on Palestine and later on Israel, was not chiseled in stone. This was evident before the Holocaust and it remained evident after. And yet, a resolution adopted by the Bund at a conference held in 55 has been presented by some as if it was a historic turning point. Some have proclaimed that in 55 the Bund adopted what has been described as a positive approach to the state of Israel, but I would stress that neither Immanuel Scherer, who was the most important Bundist ideologist of the post-war period, nor Immanuel Novogrutsky, who was general secretary of the Bund's World Coordinating Committee until his death in 61, neither of them accepted this interpretation of the position taken by the Bund in 55. Scherer presented his perspective in a number of articles, including one which appeared in the Parisian Bundist periodical Unser Stimme in April of 55. Scherer noted in this article that while the Bund had at its most recent conference listed a number of conditions under which, if filled, the state of Israel could play a positive role in the life of the Jewish people, it was clear to the Bund that these conditions would not be met by the leaders of the state. Therefore, in the present state of affairs, Scherer concluded the Bund did not find any basis to alter in essence the position which it had held up until that time. For better or for worse, Scherer's positions on both Zionism and Israel were essentially the same before and after 55, despite the very marked growth both in the total Jewish population of Israel and the proportion of world Jewry living in Israel. He insisted throughout the remainder of his life that his approach to Israel was based on the same socialist principles on which it had been based all along. Bundists, he argued, as socialists could not and did not have one standard for Israel and one for all other states. The Jewish state ought to be held to account for its treatment of minorities to the same degree and in the same manner as any other country. After 55, Scherer publicly advocated at various points for compromise by both Israel and the Arab states for recognition by the Arabs of the existence of Israel, for recognition by Israel of the rights of Yiddish language speakers within the state and of the rights of Palestinians who had fled from Israel to repatriation and compensation. As late as 72, Dr. Scherer believed that the only road to peace was via what he called an Israeli Arabic binational state. That is to say, he continued to advocate on behalf of a one-state solution. By that point in time, some Bundists, perhaps we could even say many Bundists, disagreed with Scherer on that issue. And somewhat later, the bulk of the surviving Bundists seemingly endorsed the notion of two states for two peoples. But you'll recall that I have argued that the Bund's attitude towards the Jewish community, first of Palestine and later of Israel, was not static, though its position on Zionism 
was. And the Bund saw itself as maintaining that distinction. So what are we to make of the Bund's approach? And what more specifically are we to make of the views of its most significant post-Holocaust theorist? By the time that Dr. Scherer died in 77, the Jewish population of Israel was approaching three million. Today, there are considerably more than six million Jews in the state. Scherer most definitively underestimated the state's absorptive capacity. Moreover, moreover the Yeshuv constituted 10% of the Jewish population of the world in 47, but as Danny pointed out in his intro, at the present point in time, it, at least 40% of the world's Jews live in Israel. And that proportion continues to rise quite steadily. And on the other hand, Dr. Scherer's contention, evident in his post-war writings, that Zionists placed the interests of the state above the interests of Jews elsewhere, his sense that Zionists and the state of Israel unjustly undermined Yiddish culture, and his fear that Israeli government policies would result in continuing wars and continuing dangers for Jews in Israel, well, they strike me as substantially validated by subsequent events. To be sure, the world and world Jewry is very different in the 21st century than it was in Scherer's day. 50 years after the Six Day War, however, Scherer's stances, and more generally those of the Bund, both on Zionism and on Israel, remain worthy, in my opinion, of reconsideration. Chaverum and Freund, so leben der Bund. G'day. That's uh, Australian for Chavashaft. Um, it's a great honour to be here today from Ackveld, the end of the world, Melbourne, to speak about Weltlacher Yiddishkeit, secular Jewish and Yiddish culture, that for 120 years has been a central ideal of the Bund and that continues to have real expression and relevance today. A heart to conduct for inviting me here and bringing me here to all at Yivo and Arbitering who helped make this possible, to Yanku Salant, to Irene Kronhill Pletka, to my co panelists, Dovidal, um, Marvin, and Jack, and above all, to my mentor and inspiration, the incredible Irene Klepfish. I'd like to dedicate my talk today to my late father, Simcha Burstin, who was um, a lifelong Bundist, um, a Madame Senatorist, and a founder of SCIF in Melbourne. Um, he would have been so proud. In the Russian census of 1897, 97% of Jews listed Yiddish as their mother tongue. Yiddish therefore played a critical role in the Bund, reaching the masses of Jewish workers. By 1905, the Bund also recognised the cultural value of Yiddish and began agitating for linguistic autonomy, recognition and rights. These rights, the Bund argued, were critical in responding to growing anti-Semitism. Secularisation, known in Yiddish as Weltlachkeit, literally worldliness, opened up the world for Jews, giving them increased access to knowledge and education and the broader world around them. Weltlacher Yiddishkeit enabled Ashkenazi Jews to maintain a strong Jewish identity grounded in their national history, community 
and engaged activism for Freiheit, Gleichheit, Gerechtigkeit, freedom, equality and justice as intrinsic Jewish values. The Bund saw religion as hierarchical, patriarchal institution that kept the masses compliant by encouraging people to place their trust in an invisible being, um, sorry, lost my place, that encouraged people to um, place their trust in an invisible being rather than taking united action to improve their lives. Rejection of religion was a radical act requiring great courage, particularly for those people, like both of my grandfathers, who studied to become rabbis, coming from long lines of rabbis, before coming in contact with secular Bundist ideals. But Weltlache Yiddishkeit was more than a rejection of religion. As Jacob Zuckerman writes, secularism in Jewish life is not a negation. It is a clearly positive acceptance of Jewishness that derives from thousands of years of history, culture and tradition. The Bund ensured that Weltlache Yiddishkeit empowered proletarian Jews, increasing their Yiddish literacy through adult education courses, the establishment of educational children's homes, and after World War I, founding the Zentrale Yiddische Schulorganisatie Tzisho, together with Der Linker Pole Zion, and other small organisations committed to socialist, secular Yiddish education. Tzisho's success in the face of political and economic challenges is inspirational. At its peak in 1928 to 29, there were 216 Tsisho kindergartens, elementary schools, uh, gymnasia, evening schools and teacher training programs with 24,000 students in 100 communities throughout Poland. My father, a Tsisho student and then teacher, describes the schools as a second home for the impoverished students. My buba, a teacher in the Tsisho Shulen, told me that often there wasn't enough money to pay the teachers. The schools had few resources, and so the teachers, including the beloved writer Katya Malodowski, my father's third grade teacher, created their own materials that honoured and reflected secular, working class Jewish lives. The growth in Yiddish literacy through the success of Tzisho Shulen increased the need for secular Yiddish reading materials. The Bund responded publishing books, periodicals, newspapers and literary journals featuring secular Yiddish literature and world literature in translation. These cultural materials highlighted the ways that the workers were oppressed and inspired them to fight back. The Bund maintained workers' libraries even in small townships, while the Bronislav Grosser Library in Warsaw, managed by Hermann Cook, had over 10,000 Yiddish books and 15,000 regular readers. The Bund was highly active in developing community organisations, recognising the importance of community in breaking down workers' alienation and promoting cultural autonomy. Yiddish theatre, choirs, musical concerts, Kultur Oventen, cultural evenings, poetry recitals, Laienkreisen, reading circles, all contributed to a vibrant and dynamic secular Yiddish community. The Bund integrated socialism, Deutschkeit and Weltlicher Yiddishkeit in the cultural materials and institutions that it created. Yiddish culture engagement became so powerfully linked to Bundist identities that even in the ghettos and the camps, Bundists wrote Yiddish poems, sang Yiddish songs and performed Yiddish theatre as a form of spiritual resistance that strengthened the will to rise up and survive. After the Holocaust, with Jewish life in Poland destroyed, a significant proportion of Yiddish speakers murdered 
and as survivors se zait und se spreit, dispersed all over the world, the struggle for Yiddish culture took on new meaning. In 1947, the International Jewish Labour Bund was formed in Brussels. By the late 1950s, there were 31 affiliated organisations in 13 countries. Yiddish cultural work became a primary focus of the transnational organisation. In Melbourne, as in many other places, newly arrived Bundistan poured their energy into rebuilding secular Yiddish life in accordance with Bundes principles. In May 1950, my father and some of his fellow Tsukumftistan founded SCIF Youth Movement in Melbourne. My father was the first helper or leader of SCIF. The Bundes community worked tirelessly to establish communal infrastructure of Yiddish and evening Sunday schools, Yiddish theatre groups, Yiddish choirs, Yiddish cultural events, Holocaust commemorations, Yiddish libraries, Landsmannschaften and welfare societies that nurtured the survivors and rekindled their hope. They understood the symbolic power of Yiddish. And so when my father would attend as the um, Sukhumf delegate at the Jewish Board of Deputies in Melbourne, he would insist on speaking Yiddish because it was a Jewish organisation. And they would have to find someone to translate what he had said. And when they couldn't find anybody, he translated himself. <laughs> in many countries around the world, including France, the United States, Argentina, Canada and Mexico, similar activities took place. In this way, Weltlacher Yiddishkeit continued to offer a way to be Jewish that encompassed Bundist ideals of socialism and doikeit by building strong, egalitarian, autonomous Yiddish culture wherever Jews found themselves. In the 1960s, with survivors becoming more settled in their new countries, new discussions arose about the evolving meaning and expression of Weltliche Yiddishkeit in the post-war world. These highlighted the need for developing and disseminating materials for secular celebrations of Yom Toivim that emphasise historical and ethical values and that transmit Bundist ideals of Freiheit, Gleichheit, Gerechtigkeit und Chaverschaft, freedom, equality, justice, humanity, and cultural autonomy. Communal cultural events, literature, music, art, theater, and political mo mobilization were all recognized as continuing to play an important role in sustaining secular Jewish identity. While the need for secular Yiddish day schools was widely canvassed, these aspirations were not realized in most countries. And today, um, the only secular Yiddish school remaining is Sholem Aleichem College in Melbourne, where my children are both students. Um, I believe that along with the Bund, Skiff and the Kadima Cultural Centre, this school is one of the primary reasons why such a vibrant secular Yiddish culture still exists in Melbourne. These organisations, established largely by Bundes, have ensured the Kiam and Hamshach, the continuity of Yiddish cultural life in Melbourne. Yiddish reading groups, conversation groups, walking groups, choirs, classes and cultural events make it possible to engage in Yiddish cultural activities every day of the week in Melbourne today. Last night, my children sang in Yiddish at the Bund 120 celebrations in Melbourne. That gives me great hope for the future. Today, Yiddish cultural expression is evolving to meet changed times and changed circumstances. Yiddish music, Yiddish performance, and Yiddish education continues to flourish in countless places around the globe. Strong, diverse and significant Yiddish cultural institutions are a feature in many Jewish communities. Translation initiatives bring Yiddish literature and culture to those who don't speak Yiddish. Yiddish and Weltlacher Yiddishkeit 
secular Yiddish and Jewish culture continue to enable Jews to express, e to express ethnic pride and to follow Jewish cultural practices linking Jews with their past, present and future. The Bund still exists in Melbourne, while in Paris the Madame Bibliothèque and Madame Centre continue to provide many Yiddish cultural events and activities. Bundism continues beyond these organisations too, as Bundistan, steeped in cultural values and um, in the belief of upholding dignity and justice for all, continue to struggle in social justice organisations, fighting for the principles that we hold so very dear. Yiddish, the language that has never been spoken by an oppressive government, remains a symbolic expression <laughs> of Menschlichkeit. <laughs> and I believe it's one of the reasons that draws so many young people back to Yiddish today. Um, Um, I want to just pause for a minute. I hadn't actually put it in my, in my talk, but I, I want to just comment briefly um, on Daniel's question by saying, well, I live in a Bundesgarnaden, that's the suburb next to Eckfeld, um, <laughs> in Melbourne, where Yiddish, secular Yiddish culture and the Bund remain highly relevant. I have the good fortune to spend my days teaching Yiddish at university, and I'd love, Daniel, for you to come and watch my classes because if you could see and hear my students' reactions when we study Zlatke by Miriam Ruskin about an ordinary woman in the Bund, a rank and file, and when we read Rivke Ellenberg's Zu 13 Jahre an Arrestantke, I'm arrested at the age of 13, her memoirs of a young um, revolutionary Bundist, and watching the students' reactions and seeing how deeply it affects them shows me how relevant and inspiring the Bund remains today. I think we just have to do the work to keep it inspiring. 120 years after the founding of, Bund, of the Bund, the position of Weltlacher Yiddishkeit is vastly different from how it was in the early days of the Bund. Yiddish cultural expression is still strong and dynamic, but these are not easy times for Yiddish, and particularly not for secularism, as the separation of church and state becomes a dim memory in many places, with religion exerting disproportionate and often discriminatory influence over government policy. In other places, Secularism has become an excuse for governments to control people's choices in what they can wear, in total opposition to a Weltlacher approach that values diversity. Or secularism is taken to mean being assimilated and having no cultural connection. We need to fight these injustices and dispel these misconception misconceptions. We live in difficult times. The ideals of the Bund are under threat. As Weltlach Jews who understand our connections, we watch the events unfolding here and around the world and we seek ways to support those facing tyrannical governments. We carry a powerful heritage that stood fearlessly against oppression 120 years ago 75 years ago and 50 years ago. The world desperately needs the courage, the conviction, the passion, the dynamism of Bundism. Let us act together locally and globally to support the ideals that we hold so dear. May our forebears inspire us to keep working together to build a chenere Bessere Weltlache Welt. Bis 240 mit Havaschaft.
Sei still. Sei still. Sei still. <laughs> the Bunden song has been organized and conceived by Zalman Blatek and Moish Rosenfeld. And they have put together a chorus of former campers and counselors from Camp Hemshech with, wait, there's more. <laughs> with a very strong representative, single but very dynamic representative from the SCIF in Melbourne. Please welcome the chorus. Zu 
still. Sha still. <laughs> Our second panel, it will be different than the first, it will be a discussion panel of contemporary uh, activists and they will be talking about their relationship to the Bund and how they have used their Bund in their thinking. And this panel will be chaired by Alex Weisler, Weiser. Sorry. Alex is currently the public programs manager of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, where he curates and produces programs that combine a fascination with and curiosity for historical context with an eye toward influential Jewish contributions to the culture of today and tomorrow. You can't escape. Um, he is a much loaded uh, composer, which, who you can find on YouTube, and I encourage you to do so, who most recently debuted All, All the Days Were Purple, a song cycle based on the poetry of Anna Margolin, Edward Hirsch, Rachel Korn, Avram Sutskova, and Mark Strand. Alex will introduce his panel. Doom via Tseshmater Ter Klavier, mute as a smashed piano. With these words, Yiddish poet Anna Margolin looks back on a life that has already been lived, once full of beautiful music, but now silent. Much the same description might be used for the Jewish world that gave life to the Jewish Labor Bund 120 years ago. After pogroms, two world wars, the Shoah, the oppression of Jewry by the Soviet Union, mass Jewish migrations, that world, once a tumultuous hotbed of Jewish culture, is now gone. We find ourselves today in a new world, looking back to the old Jewish world for inspiration, to create continuity, and to build our future on the foundation of the past. And we're faced with the pressing question, how does that world relate to this world? How can and how should this history inform the culture and the political life that we create today? That is the question behind much of our work here at YIVO, and it is the focus of this panel discussion. How do the history and the ideas of the Bund inform us today? I'm Alex Weiser, I'm the manager of public programs here at YIVO, um, and I'm also, as Irena mentioned, a composer of contemporary classical music. I was born and raised here in Manhattan, um, and I discovered Yiddish culture and the Bund as an adult through my work here at YIVO, um, and I'm joined today by three panelists for this discussion. Um, Claire Kinberg is a librarian, teacher, and writer living in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where she's the director of education for Reconstructionist Congregation and the adult and children's librarian for Reform Congregation. She has worked with the New Jewish Addenda and was a founding member of the Brit Tzedek Vasholem Jewish Alliance for Justice and Peace and was the managing editor of Bridges, a Jewish feminist journal. Anne Toback as the executive director of the Workman Circle, where she works to uh, power progressive Jewish identity through Jewish cultural engagement, Yiddish language learning, multi-generational education, and social justice activism. A lifelong progressive activist and trained attorney, and previously served as the assistant ex executive director at the Writers Guild of America East. Avram Pot comes from a family of activists involved in the Bund in Poland. Its youth, youth organization, SCIF, and in other Jewish labor and cultural organizations in the US. Pot has been involved in political theater, created plays based on Yiddish stories, oversaw statewide community-based anti-poverty programs, managed an electric cooperative that pioneered in energy efficiency and renewable energy, and held elected office. Pot continues his involvement in environmental and social justice causes today, and sings and drums in a Vermont klezmer band. So to get started, I'm going to invite each of the panelists to um, make a brief introductory remarks, and then we will uh, get into the conversation. Hello. Uh, 
I, a little bit more about uh, my, my background. My, my grandfather, uh, Yankif Pat, was the general secretary of the Bund's education programs in Poland and a prolific writer. Uh, my, my father, uh, Dr. Emanuel Pat, um, was the leader for a while of, of SCIF and worked at the Medem Sanator Sanatorium, and my mother was a counselor in the SCIF camps. They all uh, left Poland before the war and continued their uh, connections to Jewish labor and Yiddish cultural uh, organizations in, in this country, uh, most notably my, my grandfather, Yankif Pat, being the general secretary of the Jewish Labor Committee from around 1938 till the early 1960s. Um, so I grew up knowing first about what they were doing in this country. Um, and that was the, the sviva, the environment that, that I grew up in. And as I got a little bit older, um, I learned more and more about where the, they came from uh, and, and the Bund. Um, and I also realized I, m I moved uh, to Vermont pretty much. I've lived there my entire adult life, uh, which so the thread is a little bit uh, different for me from the, the Bund uh, to activism uh, in Vermont. But I did realize really in thinking about this program that it was the fact that I went to two Yiddish secular summer camps, Camp Bybrook and then Camp Hemshech, where for two months of every summer, starting from probably around the age of seven, I was spent the time in the country. That and reading Henry David Thoreau is what probably uh, got me to live uh, in, in, in the country. But I realized that it was that camp environment of uh, not just the, the, uh, the Yiddish socialist secular environment, uh, but also a, a culture of, of youth and communal living uh, that got me to Vermont. Hi. So I, I want to sort of transfer it to the organization that I represent, um, that I proudly represent, the Workmen's Circle. And we consider ourselves one of the heirs to the, to the Bund. And every year it feels like it becomes more and more important, um, more of an organizing tool for new generations, and just more as Essentially, it's just part of our DNA. Um, I have been charged, along with an amazing group of lay leaders, to reshape the workman circle, the arbiter ring for the 21st century. And um, for the last nine years, I've taken it through an amazing journey um, along, alongside a, a lot of amazing people. Um, what we have found today in 2017 is that the, that DNA, the Bund, DNA is perhaps our greatest Yerusha next to the people and, and what they bring to us. Um, it's this holistic approach to Jewish identity that resonates so much with um, young Jews today in the United States and around the world. Um, not just uh, that we're activists because we're unapologetically, we're aggressively activist for economic justice for all and I'm looking forward to speaking to that specifically because we're facing some, some very, very difficult, some terrifying times today. But we're also activists for our Yiddishkeit, for our Yiddish language. Um, we're teaching it. And, and I want to share, as of yesterday, this semester we're teaching 275 students Yiddish. Um, thank you. Hi. I couldn't be more excited. So, so it's, and it's Jewish culture, it's bringing people together. So it's this intersection and we very much pattern the Bund and you know, just one quick addition, we proudly wear Yiddish sashes now when we march. Um, and it's not just the workman circle, it's all of the coalition uh, members that we bring together um, we have an interesting sash that Yiddish on one side, a Shanner and Bessera Welt, and English on the other side, the, the translation. And I always sort of look to see as people take the sash, they can make the choice how they display. Um, 95 and maybe it's 98% put on the Yiddish. And these are 
young, usually younger Jews um, in their 20s and their 30s, where we've created coalitions with, if not now, with, um, with uh, the DSA, uh, with the DSA Youth Movement, um, with Habonim Dror, Hashemer Hatzayer. They're all putting on the Yiddish side, and we march together, really arm in arm, proudly. So the Bund is an amazing influence, and I think it, it's both alive and growing in new ways. So I'm Claire Kinberg, and I'm probably one of the very few people here who did not grow up in the Bund or with Yiddish culture. Um, but at a pretty young age, I um, was both deeply connected to my Jewish identity as a Reformed Jew living in St. Louis, and also to um, wanting to be part of a struggle against racism and injustice in our country. And um, I found the Bund through reading and, um, and found that the, the struggles, that the, the things that the Bundists wrote about and were involved in related so directly to the things that I needed to know that I just kept reading and kept being involved in social justice um, organizing and, and the they, they two fed each other. So that I, under, I came to understand in the, in the 1980s that I wanted to organize within the Jewish community to be part of a broader social justice movement. And I learned this, how to do this, and how to think about it through Bundists, like you all here. And um, I, I, I just, to bring it right into the current present, I um, feel very connected to the movement for black lives and feel that the Jewish community has, it, it, this is, that we are, need to be allies to fundamentally change the way that our society is organized, and that um, we can do this with others, that there's no other way to do it but with others, and that we can come to it as a Jewish community, if we organize within our communities, um, to recognize our connections to other communities and the things that we have in common and the ways in which the communities are, are different, but that we can come together with common goals. So I, I thank the um, Bundes of, of the past and present for uh, teaching me about these things. And I particularly wanted to come here today to directly express my gratefulness to um, those of you who've been involved in translating Yiddish writings from the past um, into English so that I can um, continue to learn from what my Jewish community has done in the past. So in the previous academic panel, we just we heard um, the ideas of the Bund in three main categories, Doakite, Socialism, and Weltliche Yiddishkeit. So we're going to discuss a bit each of those categories and how those ideas resonate or resonate a bit differently today, 120 years after the Bund was founded. So I was thinking perhaps we could start with the Doakite. And um, I w wanna pose this question to everyone here, how does the mass migration that has happened over the last 120 years and the existence of the shape of the state of Israel, which was touched upon, um, how does that reshape our notion of Doakite and of uh, Jewish nationalism in the diaspora? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Well, I, I will start. <laughs> I, that is the, the doikite here-ness is something that's, that's always resonated with me, but I, I mean, I really look at where we live. We live in a country that was um, where the foundational existence of slavery um, was, it has, it, it's, it's divide, it's, it's, it's a ethos of our country that's continued and that if we, that that is the country that we as Jews live in. And I think that we as Jews approach, we have to approach facing this country's history and where, how we can in this country work to make a, a future that's without exploitation, that, that has the Bundes ideals. So I don't think it, my organization has, has really stepped us away ever from the here-ness. Um, uh, and as such, I find that we're you know, incredibly in the moment today, um, along with many other organizations. I think the Jewish community is at a moment where we, at least in the United States, we're, we're acknowledging that these are our problems. I don't, I, I think in so many ways, um, we're, we're not, very few people are looking to um, run anywhere. I mean, we had a lot of talk, in fact, before the election, a lot of us, you know, joked about moving to Canada, but very few people did because we understand we're here. And I think embracing that we're, we in some ways were part of the problem and today um, we must be part of the solution is, is very much akin to this ideology. Um, I also, you know, don't wanna shy away from a big question that faces the entire Jewish world, which is how do we connect with Israel? Israel has been a part of the Jewish world in different ways. Um, today, it's a very troubled part in, on, on many levels. So I think there's two conversations we need to have. One is, the, the, to me, it's a very clean conversation. We, we're Americans. I mean, I'm, an, I'm a member, I'm a citizen of the United States, and I'm going to be on the front lines fighting and fighting and fighting until we gain the freedom uh, that our country allegedly was built on and will be built on um, again. But the second question is how do we as Jews integrate what Israel means to us um, and how our identities are impacted by it? And I, I wish I, I could go into further, but I don't think it's right for this conversation. Obviously, there's, there's no question that those, the historic events that, that, that you mentioned that happened to the, the Jewish people, um, uh, they happen, they, they affect this. The establishment of the state of Israel um, and the fact that it is a state um, and the fact that such a large uh, percentage of the Jews of the world now live there is, uh, is an undeniable fact. Um, but uh, as I think about this, I think about uh, the, the, the principle of uh, doikite, uh, starting from the beginning of the Bund, is not a principle of nationalism. It has nothing to do with nationalism. So uh, it, 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 it does not, I do, I do not myself um, identify my Jewishness as ever having anything to do with a nation. Uh, it has to do with, first of all, living where, where I live, uh, whether it's uh, the United States or, or Vermont specifically. Um, and, and it has to do with how we uh, behave and act in the world. That's what I think of as, as doikite. And as, as for me, and I think for most of the people in this room, that's the same as it ever was. Okay. Yeah, please. I think that to be to be realistic, that we that in the current moment, there is when when we participate 
when Jews participate in movements, current movements for um, against racism and uh, other social justice movements that are happening right now, we will also encounter anti-Israel sentiments. And it, it's been used for the last 30, 40 years, as, as least as long as I've been organizing, as a way to separate Jews from the rest of the, uh, from other social justice movements. And what my feeling is, is that we just can't let it separate us because we need social justice now as much as we ever did. And we also need to stand up for and be representative of what we know to be true for Jews. That almost half of Jews live in Israel and um, Israel may need to change. It's not something that we need, to, that we can let, we can let divide us from the um, rest of the, from other social justice movements because we need both things. Um, and it's a, it, I think that it's a very difficult, I mean, if we're facing reality, it's a really difficult time and a difficult place, but I think that we're up for it because we have to be. Let's talk a bit about socialism. So what role does Jewishness play in socialism, which is really a universalist kind of ideology? And, and, what ro and how does that role change today being in America from you know, what we were hearing about earlier? Is there, is there such a thing as Jewish socialism right now? I, I think that, uh, first of all, uh, the, the word socialism has, uh, for many people, taken on um, a, a somewhat different meaning or a lesser meaning. Uh, ob obviously, some people use it uh, as, as, as a negative. Um, but uh, the um, Jews in this country uh, are uh, demographically not the same kind of working class as uh, the uh, workers um, that we just sang about <laughs> uh, on, on, on the stage. Um, and so I think of uh, my own, uh, the, work, the work that I do in a variety of areas as, as uh, is it socialism? I don't know. Is it, uh, is it progressive? Is it sometimes radical? Uh, I, I th I th I'm not sure that the, the, the word socialism seems a little bit um, narrow now to me uh, in, in terms of what, uh, what we face um, uh, in, in the world. And it, one of the, the issues that I have spent a large part of my career on uh, has, is, uh, is climate change uh, and the environment. And those were not issues that the Bundes thought much about. Um, <laughs> Uh, as Bundes, I think Bundes uh, today think about that like everybody else should. Um, uh, but uh, so, so I, I think of uh, the, I, I see the, uh, the thread, uh, the, uh, sometimes it's a meandering one, sometimes it's a straight line um, uh, from the Bund uh, to what uh, activist Jews um, are today or should be today. Um, and, and I don't worry too much about whether it's the, the word socialist is the appro most appropriate word all the time. So, so I would add a little bit more to that. I was, I was a little surprised. I was, I was deferring to you from Vermont because, of course, we know the senator from Vermont as, as a um, unabashed socialist born in Brooklyn. Um, and what I've experienced is socialism is really galvanizing a lot of young Jews today. They're owning um, the, the ideals of socialism, which 
And when you, if you ask them to unpack it, a lot of it will overlap with the Bundist ideals we're talking about. Um, and I think in many ways it's for us to connect the dots. Um, the um, Democratic Socialists of America has risen to 30,000 members right now. That's a, that's a significant high. Um, when you see, even today, when, when Senator Sanders goes out and speaks, he fills halls, like 20, 30, th I mean, he, 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 he packs them in. Um, I think they're looking for something beyond the two-party system that has failed us so terribly here. And I think socialism is, is one of the, um, the words that's starting to attract young voters. And um, certainly, in large part, thanks to Sanders, but in large part, also thanks to a lot of organizing that goes on. So um, I don't think the book has been shut on socialism. I think uh, it's, it's something that um, we have to listen a little more to, to the millennials um, and, uh, to, and, and, and to who's coming after them. Yeah. Uh, and I would, ag I, I agree that uh, for the for you know the last several decades we've kind of shied away from the word socialism because of the atmosphere in the in the country. But um, that the younger people that I work with in the schools where I teach, the teachers who are in college now, they're really interested to learn about socialism and about Jewish socialism, and they're um, definitely like ready to. To, to try to, to think about, they are thinking about a radical reorganization of the way that the, the way that our economy works. And uh, they're not scared of the word socialism. If I could just add one thing, um, I see also an expansion of how um, young people are defining their Jewish heritage and culture and roots and how it connects to social justice. They no longer just, when I was growing up, when we talked about Jewish social justice, we tended to look to texts um, and, and we look at books and literature. Today, there's a real expansion to cover traditions and um, on the ground activism. So there's also an opening there. When people talk about looking at activism through a Jewish lens, um, they're actually talking about the, in, in some cases, in many cases, um, the Bundist heritage of speaking up and, and speaking out and acting in concert. So um, we need, I think, to stretch our definition of the Jewish lens today to really incorporate the traditions next to the texts and the religious heritage. So there's a secular piece that's coming forward as there's this growing number of young Jews in America who identify Jewishly but not religiously and who may have only one parent, who very often may just have one parent who identifies Jewishly. Um, there's a fluidity to the young that actually poses a lot of opportunities to connect them to this Jewish lens and, and to our really proud heritage of resistance. Just uh, another thought, and I, I guess it, it's uh, it, again about the, the, the how we use the, the word socialism. Um, and it may, it may be reflective of, of, uh, of, of where I live, but I'll, I'll talk about healthcare. I mentioned my father was a doctor. He was thrown out of the Brown, Bronx County Medical Society when President Kennedy proposed Medicare. Um, and he told me um, when I was around 14, when it was actually approved under, under President Johnson, that the best thing about it would be that within a few years it would be obvious to everyone that everyone should have it. Um, um, okay. So uh, sk skip forward a number a number of years later. Uh, I was I served a term in the Vermont legislature, and and just as I was elected, and I was about to s be serving on the health care committee. Um, our governor at the time, we had been looking at, at, at moving to a single payer system just for the state of Vermont, and the governor who had been the chief advocate of that uh, pulled the plug on it. Um, and the leader of the uh, Vermont Senate Republican Party at that time wrote a uh, editorial saying, now what do we do? And he concluded with saying that we really should be working at this on a national level, uh, but basically uh, we should have Medicare for all. 
Uh, so I wrote a, uh, a, a column that was published a few months ago in which I uh, quoted him um, saying that. And my, my point here is, um, it, in my experience in the, in the political world and with the constituents I serve, uh, and now my own experience having, uh, having reached the age I do, the nation loves Medicare. How do we get Medicare for all? It, it becomes, starts becoming obvious, and, and my concern, the, w the way I think of things in the world is, um, call it what you want. I don't, I don't, you know, if you, if you call it, uh, if, you, if you give it certain names, that's not gonna happen. If you, if you don't give it certain names, then everyone will say, well, of course we should do that. And so that's, in, in, in the world we live in, that's, that's my approach to things. So when we, when we talk about the activism, whatever form it takes, as being particularly Jewish, I'm hearing a lot about the Bund's legacy, about history, about Jewish community. Uh, one of the big things for the Bund was the Yiddish language, which has really changed dramatically as we no longer <coughs> have you know, the vast majority of Jews speaking Yiddish in a vernacular, as a vernacular language. How does Yiddish play any role in this continuation of, of this activism in our culture today? What, if so, what role does it play? So uh, if I might, because I, I, I mentioned it in my opening remarks, we are, I am seeing a, a revival of Yiddish um, and something that's resonating with um, young people today, um, not on a small scale, on a large scale. Now that doesn't mean they all want to learn the language. I mean, I may be thrilled at the 275 students, but that's 275 students um, in, the, in the vast universe. But they are looking to connect to their roots. Um, part of, um, I think, what we're dealing with is a, a new generation who no longer is stopping at the Holocaust as where their heritage began. They're going behind it, and they're saying, oh, there was, a, they're, they're connecting with the thousand years of Jewish life that existed, um, in addition to learning the lessons and, and commemorate, memorializing the Holocaust. They're, they're, they're really trying to incorporate a comprehensive past identity. And they're discovering Yiddish as the language of this thousand years, and they're amazed because it wasn't taught to them um, in their Hebrew schools, if they went to Hebrew school. It wasn't, you know, many of them, perhaps their grandparents spoke, but be aware, less and less the case. So there's something that's resonating with them about uh, the language of the Jewish people. And they get that it's not just a language. We do it a disservice to call it a language. It's Yiddishkeit, it's the values, it's, it's the history, it's the traditions. And um, young people are seeing that as one way to organize around this very proud and high culture past. So if we want to, it, it's something we, we're learning from and we're using more and more. Um, one of the most, uh, the best organizing tools I've had this year is a, um, is a, a button that, um, you, you know, again, returning to our tradition of humor, defined um, the difference between a mensch and a putz, uh, and, it, and it was called <laughs> Yiddish 101. I have a few in my bag if you're interested. Um, it's, it's something that we can't give enough away. I mean, we've given away thousands and thousands, and it's Yiddish 101. And people are connecting. Kids are connecting. The sashes, we can't keep them in. We keep saying, please return them after the march. All right, so, so we always come back a few shorter. It's about people wishing to connect proudly with their past. And I couldn't be more excited by it, and I think everyone in this room is challenged to think about how we can continue that and bring more and more of the values and the history and the, you know, this strong, unequivocal approach to social justice activism to, to these new generations and allow them to run with it. So uh, I live in Vermont. Uh, uh, 
I, I'm the singer in what is universally acclaimed to be the absolutely finest klezmer band in the entire state. Um, um, the, um, so I, I, uh, I, I don't, I'm generally, I'm the kind of, it's a small state and I've uh, over the years kind of been a go-to person. If people have questions about Yiddish or how do you say something, or they have some family letters or something, I'm, I'm often the person uh, that, that, that gets that. But what I found, uh, and I found this particularly in the two years I was in the legislature sitting sometimes in very frustrating debates in the, in the House chamber, uh, I could help myself by thinking in Yiddish. Um, and, and, and no one else would ever know what I was thinking, obviously. Um, uh, but um, what, what happened was that in, in Vermont and the legislature towards the end of each session, there was a, a, a cabaret, which is a, a, a fundraiser for a nonprofit organization, uh, legislators and legislative staff, and it's really just among, among us. And I, for two years in a row, uh, I was the big hit uh, with a routine called um, uh, Some Yiddish Curses Appropriate for the Vermont General Assembly. Um, <laughs> and so it resonates. It can resonate even in, in a place where, where Yiddish is not, doesn't have, uh, have much of a base. People got the humor. Um, people would come up to me and ask me, um, what was that, can, can you teach me how to say that one? Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and all of that. It is, uh, it is a way, it, the Yiddish is a language obviously, but it's a, it's a way of thinking. I think we, we all know that. It, it's, it, 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 it comes uh, from, from our history, um, but, it, but it, it, it's a way we think. And I, f I found myself um, uh, immersed in my head in Yiddish. Uh, the worse things got, <laughs> uh, the more Yiddish uh, was, 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 in my, was in my head. Rescue me. <laughs> and, and maybe that, that's a, a good uh, launch for what I, what I wanted to say, which was that the, the um, Yiddish kite and the Yiddish language and the Yiddish culture, that what you brought up, is so deep. And it's, it's, there's a, the, the current generation is looking for and needing something deep that relates to being Jewish because things are are un, very unsettled. It, I mean, people know that that Israel is in a is in a moral crisis, and our country is in a moral crisis, and the young people are looking for and needing deep answers or just deep ways to approach it. And it's, in the, 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 it's there. Um, I'm so glad that there's you know, people who are, you are reaching that are looking for it and signing up and saying, yes, I want this. This is a real quickie. It's actually a plea for some assistance. Um, as we were heading, getting in the car and heading um, to New York uh, yesterday, I got an email from the accordion player in our band, who's a, a red diaper baby, by the way. Um, um, and he asked me, he said, so this came up. Is there a Yiddish word for the suitcase that you keep packed and by the door <laughs> in case you need to flee? And, and he knew I was coming here, and I said, I'm, I'm coming to the epicenter of, of, of Yiddish language, and uh, there are going to be linguists and translators, so please see me if you can think of something. Thank you. <laughs> So although there's so much more we'd like to discuss, I think it's time for us to wrap up, but let's continue these discussions um, in, a, in just a little while in the Great Hall for the reception. Could, could I just end with one, sure. one thought? Because it, this is so resonant to me and to I think all of us. I, I came with one number that I really want to read to you. We're living in the United States today where the top 1% of, of, the, of the United States control 38.6% of the wealth. And the bottom 90% control 22.8%. We're living in a country that in 2016 elected a series of people who, who were elected based on blaming the other. 
blaming the other by name, be it Mexican, LGBTQ, um, Jewish, uh, a Muslim, refugee, immigrant. I mean, as I sit here today, history is repeating itself and we don't have a choice right now. If we are the other, I was, we all experienced in different ways Charlottesville. Um, they were targeting Jews. I mean, we're hearing those words again. So I just wanna urge everyone here, we have a choice as Jews and certainly as, as people who are commemorating and, and honoring and celebrating the Bund to step up and, and make something happen. We have to close the economic divide today. It's as important as it was 120 years ago. And I'm hoping if nothing else, people will walk away with, with that charge because the other is us today as much as it is everyone else, as much as it is African Americans and members of LGBTQ and Mexicans and, and people who are Muslims and keep going, refugees. So I, I, we're having fun and we should have fun, but I'm scared and I think everyone here is scared too. So let, let, let's leave, you know, to take, leave convinced to take further action in the Bund's name. Thanks very much. Thank you three very much. We have just a few more brief words before the reception, so just bear with us. I know we're running a bit over time. Um, thank you. I promise you we are coming in for a landing. <laughs> and I promise you that this is a liyama and therefore there will be gedektetition. <laughs> but there were several people in different corners of the world who were unable to be with us here today and therefore we feel an obligation to at least allow them to say a few words. So please bear with me. First, Tayere Chavertes und Chaverem. As part of the Bundist family, the Jewish Socialist Group in Great Britain sends greetings of friendship and solidarity to all in New York who are gathered to mark the 120th anniversary of the foundation of the Bund. We're very proud to associate ourselves with the ideals, struggles, and achievements of the foremost Jewish socialist movement in history. Those ideals about building a socialism that is democratic and culturally diverse, promoting a progressive secular Jewish identity and fighting for a Jewish community that is open-minded, enlightened, and pluralistic, creating real equality and cultural autonomy for minorities in nation states, dogkeit, diasporism, and internationalism are the ideals we continue to hold firmly and to fight for in our work. And we fight wholeheartedly against those ideas and forces that threaten or undermine those ideals. Fascism, racism, nationalism, including Jewish nationalism, and all forms of bigotry. Here in Britain, we have joined with others recently to help found a new group in the Labor Party called the Jewish Voice for Peace. I'm sorry, it's Jewish Voice for Labor. We are very pleased that its statement of principles includes a slightly adapted version of Emmanuel Scherer's expression of Bundist philosophy rights and justice for Jews everywhere without wrongs and injustice to other people anywhere. We would love to end by saying bis 120, but we've already reached that one. <laughs> so Levin der Bund, mit Chavrschaft, David Rosenberg, on behalf of the National Committee of the Jewish Socialist Group London. <laughs> Secondly, ot ot. I promise this will not take long and it's absolutely necessary. Our second greeting is from a dear Chaver who turns 95 years old today, is in Israel and would have loved to be here with us and could not come. Chasheve, Chaverem, Freund und Gest, Batelikte in der Simche von Ivo, obmerkendigte historische Date von 120 Jahr Bund, 
wie einer von den ältesten aktiven Bundisten bei Deurich, was sich kennisch sein mit euch und sich beteiligen mit euch in unser Allemens Simche. Ich bin aber gar besonders stolz damit, was ot der feierliche Jubiläum von Bund fällt euch genau in Tag von meinem persönlichen 95. Gebäudentag. <lacht> Wünsche ich euch von der weiten der Volk von ot dem feierlichen Zusammenkunft von der bundischen Besprache, was ist gewähnt eine von den Symptomen und Charakterstrichen von der bundischen Bewegung wie die Bewegung, was ist in Läuf von ihrer ganzen Geschichte gegangen, gegen den Strom und gegen die Strömungen, was haben verfließt die jüdische Gas, dem Klär, der Kommunism und der Zionism, welche haben gebeut auf Katastrophies. In dem Prat hat der Bund verspielt der Geschichte, weil welcher gesunder Meuer hat gekannt der losen dem Gedanken, als ein zivilisiert Volk, soll sich verwandeln in Chaos und austraten das europäische Jüdentum, ein Drittel von jüdischem Volk. Die Lebensfragen, der Organ von Bund, wenn man sich dachte, ich bin gewähnt in Mächer von 43 Jahren, ist gewähnt heimzeitig und konsequent. Und die letzte Zeitung auf Jüdisch, das ist der Schinnen in Israel. Die reaktionäre Strömungen, was beherrscht jetzt das Land? Nun, der letzte der Bundistin ist ausgestorben. Der bundische Gedanke ist aber geblieben bei einer größeren Zahl trachtendige Menschen. Bei Griechenreich, Armen und wünscht der Volk der Konferenz der Covid-120 Jahre Bund mit Haverschaft. Jetzt hat Luden Tel Aviv. Und ot, ot, ot. Irene. Two, the two more, we have two film clips, one and a half film clips, one and a half minutes a piece, right? Who turns it on? Some are happy, some less happy, that's how Bundes gatherings work. Can we turn it on? Haberschaft, Verweigerung, Habertus und Freund. 120 Jahre ist nicht keine Kleinigkeit. In Namen von einem jüdischen Arbeiterbund und Skiff in Australien war Christen mir allemen zum bundischen Jäubo. Sei dort in Australien und euch in New York beim Jäubo. Our movement spans a tumultuous history of which we are proud. From revolution to resistance, from education to Yiddish secular culture. Labour rights to unionism, Freiheit, Gleichheit, Gerechtigkeit, Deutschheit, Socialism, Yiddishkeit. These are all the things that the Bund represents and more. To unsere Chaverim, Chavitas und Freunde in New York and beyond, Chaverschaft, unser Leben der Bund. Hi, friendly Edel from the Medan Abitering Center in Paris, one of the left-wing cultural Jewish organizations that continues to transmit part of the Bund's legacy by organizing more than 70 cultural, musical, political, memorial events each year. The Bund may be dead, but he won. We won. We obtained all the rights for which the Bund was fighting for. We can reside and go wherever we want. We transmit our, our so rich Jewish culture through our own institutions. We are fully citizens of the country in which we have chosen to live and we participate in the debates of political life in accordance with the decade one of the main principles all laid down by the Bund. After vier Werther in Yiddish, he has some words in French. Bonne fête d'anniversaire, longue vie aux idées d'émancipation, d'égalité, de justice sociale et de culture que le Bund a cessé de promouvoir depuis 120 ans 
et que nous nous efforçons de transmettre aux générations suivantes. You know how we end these events. Zalman and Rock have prepared for us a Zalman and Moshe Rosenfeld and Shuldik Merchaver have prepared for us a finale.